Hi, it is Monday, the 12th of July, and I continue to read and wonder my way through Matthew's Gospel. And today we're in Matthew chapter 14, verses 1 to 12. Uh, all through last week, we were doing uh, Matthew 13, and Jesus taught in parables, but then at the end, we, we had a story, um, not a parable, a story of Jesus in his hometown and not being well-respected. It, it's as if they they can't see who Jesus is because they kind of know who Jesus was, right? Uh, he was a kid. He lived in the neighborhood. He can't possibly, um, he can't possibly be God's presence, right? He can't be... Or just for them at that point, he cannot be a prophet of such of such stature. He can't possibly be revealing the word uh, or the will of God because, well, he's just Jesus, the kid next door. Um, and so Jesus leaves uh, his hometown. And that's where we pick it up today. So it's Matthew 4, 1 to 12. And if, um, if you're doing this um, on the video meditation, um, so audio folk, it's different. But if you're doing this on the video meditation... The awkward thing is, um, this is almost exactly the text that was preached in church at Jubilee yesterday by, uh, by Reverend Marlene Britton, and she did a great job. Uh, and, and as I wonder if I'm thinking different things, it's not because I'm disagreeing with what was a really great sermon. In fact, you might be better to stop now, go to yesterday's um, virtual service at Jubilee. Uh, you can find it at our website or on this YouTube channel. And... Uh, Skip right ahead to the sermon, the sermon if you want, um, because uh, Marlene does a really nice job with this text uh, and how it's really more about Jesus. Um, it was really well done. So I'm going to wonder about it, but I mean, as I say, um, no disrespect. Um, and, and as I mentioned, this is Matthew's gospel. Marlene preached from Mark's gospel yesterday, but this is one of the times where Matthew has lifted uh, the material from Mark almost without change. I mean, it is it is almost identical. Uh, and we do know that Mark was a source for, for both, both Matthew and, and Luke. Okay, lots of preamble. Um, enough of that. Last week we had parables. Jesus in his hometown. They don't get who he is. Today, Matthew 14, 1 to 12. This is what happens. At that time, Herod, the ruler, heard reports about Jesus. And he said to his servants, this is John the Baptist. He has been raised from the dead, and for this reason these powers are at work at him. For Herod had arrested John, bound him, and put him in prison on account of Herodias, his brother Philip's wife, because John had been telling him, It is not lawful for you to have her. Though Herod wanted to put him to death, he feared the crowd because they regarded him as a prophet. But when Herod's birthday came, the daughter of Herodias danced before the company, and she pleased Herod so much that he promised on oath to grant her whatever she might ask. Prompted by her mother, she said, Give me the head of John the Baptist here on a platter. The king was grieved, yet out of regard for his oaths and the guests, he commanded it to be given. He sent and had John beheaded in the prison. The head was brought on a platter and given to the girl who brought it to her mother. His disciples came and took the body and buried it. And then they went and told Jesus. So, what is there to wonder about this? Why is Matthew telling the story? Well, as my friend would say um, in yesterday's sermon, um, John is, is, is a difficult character, a difficult person, a difficult uh, voice for Herod to manage. Herod is, is, is in power, and yet this voice um, calling him out, recognizing that he is not living um, faithfully uh, as a Jew, that uh, he may well fit in with Rome, but he is he is not living up to his his obligations um, as 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 a Jewish person. You don't um, you don't marry your brother's wife not when he's alive. Um, you should not be all that impressed um, or drawn in by your niece's dancing. Um, by the way, Herodias's daughter, we would also know her as Salome. Um, and that may sort of help give this some context. Um, uh, so, so as much as John is perplexing, so too is Jesus. Um, and John is making that connection. John, uh, John, excuse me, Herod is making that connection. Herod um, hears about Jesus and it's like, oh man, it's John all over again. I thought I got rid of him, but I can't. Um, 
So there might be something in this uh, for Matthew, um, who, who compiles and writes this gospel. There might be something in the, the persistence of God's word. Um, if God is trying to tell you something, um, you are not going to shut it out. You may try to block your ears, um, but, but you will not stop God from delivering the message. You may choose not to hear, but that will be on you. So he kills John the Baptist, and yet the message is still coming. Um, he, uh, he is not swayed by, by John's message, although he is, seems to be perhaps intrigued by it. Um, but, um, but he turns away from that, and yet the message comes again, this time in Jesus, so even more. The waves are bigger, as it were. And so I think Matthew wants that sense, perhaps. We definitely want a connection um, between John and Jesus and their ministries. So not only is Jesus baptized by John, but when they go to collect John's body, when John's disciples go to collect his body to bury it, they come and tell Jesus. You get that sense that these are related. Has Jesus taken over um, John's ministry? Um, or are, are the John disciples now following Jesus? Or are many of them? Is it like a merger? Um, so there is definitely a connection. And in that, I think then we are invited to sort of imagine um, that Jesus stands outside of authority, um, but has authority. Not authority granted him by government, but authority granted him by God. Herod has all sorts of authority granted him by Rome, but... Does anyone really respect it? They fear it, absolutely, uh, but they don't necessarily respect it. Um, but John had authority from God, and people respected it. They weren't afraid of it. Uh, Jesus is God's authority. Um, and again, we just heard in his hometown uh, last week, uh, they didn't respect it. Um, they didn't respect that authority. They had troubles with it. Um, and but but it is but it's not by threat so you get it or you don't get it so last week we heard about a hometown uh, who are receiving it no threat but they don't get it um here we have somebody who gets it herod gets it but he is not able to act on it because he is he is trapped um in many ways he's trapped by by his privilege he's trapped by his power he is trapped by his insecurity. He is trapped by his fear. And that might be the part that makes me wonder the most in, in the 21st century, uh, here and now. And I don't know if Matthew uh, it was inviting this, although I, th I kind of think he is. I think Matthew is, is inviting this with this story. This story of Jesus, um, uh, and, and, or of John the Baptist, but sort of Jesus as relating to John the Baptist, this story is told in Mark's Gospel. It's, it's, it's told in Luke. Um, a little changes here and there, but not much. Um, why is Matthew telling the story? Why is it important to, to Matthew? So the connection between Jesus and John, I can see that. But more than that, <sighs> Herod gets it, but can't let himself get it. Now, I don't know how life works for you, how faith works for you, but there are times in my own faith life where I get it. I know what God is saying to me, but I don't want to hear it. I know what God is saying to me, but it doesn't fit in with my plans. I know what God is saying to me, but it is going to make it very difficult to live within the life that I have constructed. I am kind of trapped, right? Um, there's a... There, well, and, and to pick up another image, and, and I don't think it's a mistake that it's here. Uh, there's a there's a very set choreography in my life, and I'm going to have to follow that. And I can hear Jesus, I can hear God inviting me to dance freely. Don't worry about the steps. Just, just dance. Just revel in creation. Just be who you are. Express yourself. Love as 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 you love i i can f hear that call but i know if i do i'll fall out of step and i won't be in the show uh i'll fall out of step and people will sneer and i will be ashamed and embarrassed i will fall out of step and i might be pushed aside you know out into the wilderness where john came from where jesus spent time before beginning the ministry I am often afraid of the wilderness. Herod is afraid, I believe, of the wilderness. 
right? When John the Baptist calls him to his Jewish heritage to, to, to be a good, faithful Jew, Herod's afraid to go there. He would rather live in Rome, right? Where, where and I don't necessarily mean physically in Rome, but I mean within the Roman Empire where Roman rules apply. And Roman rules say he can have his, 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 his brother's wife. And Roman rules say he can uh, lust after his, his niece, if that's what he wants to. Roman rules say his family isn't dysfunctional. They're just interesting. Um, and so he'd rather live there, but it has its own kind of constraints because of course, what God is offering is, is re right relationship, um, uh, with all of creation. And what Rome is offering is compliance with the empire. Time to time, I do feel that I am complying with the empire. Uh, I'd like to think that that's not the only way to describe my life, and it's not the dominant feature of my life, but it definitely is a part of it from time to time. I, I like to read this story and go, well, I'm one of the followers of John the Baptist. Um, but the truth is, I read this story, and I'm a little bit Herod. Oh, there are things I probably should do, but I, you know, no, but everybody's doing it, so why not? Um, I am one of the guests uh, who recognizes there's something not right about all of this, but I'm not going to say anything. How often do I look at the world around me, uh, the community, the place where I live, and just see things going on and go like, well, that can't be right. Somebody, everybody's doing it, never mind. And so I let it go. I'm not talking about being judgmental. I'm talking about being uh, discerning and helpful and not letting people just sort of drive off the cliff willy-nilly, but in love saying, well, well wait a minute, there, there's another thing that you might want to think about. There's another way to look at this, right? Not every job you apply to um, should be the highest paying. That, that shouldn't be the only reason you go after a job. Um, not every relationship you should go after should be based on on a single quality. Um, like, you know, it's just like, you no know, broaden. Free yourself up. I, I, I can feel that call from time to time, but eh, why bring it up? I'm not, I'm not going to. So I'm just one of the guests that I'm watching Herod enjoy his niece's dancing. That just seems all so creepy. Um, I don't know. Maybe... Maybe I'm clutching at straws here. Um, the other thing that I, I, I find interesting um, is dancing. And I don't know what your experience with dance is, uh, but um, <laughs> I took dance classes. Don't get me started. Uh, I took ballet classes and I took tap and I did take jazz uh, and I was bad at all of it. Um, dancing is not my thing, never has been my thing, but I have enjoyed it. I have enjoyed dancing, and um, dance is meant to just be freely expressing, enjoying your physicality, um, moving and, sh and, and, and processing, sharing your grief, uh, your joy, your expectation, your excitement, your all of those things, all of those things that, that I have trained myself to, to, to find words for, dance invites my body to express them and to share them and communicate them. And also, in a strange way, in dance, to receive them. It, it's, a, it's a wonderful, um, basic communication. And it's, and it's freeing, right? Um, there is joy in the dance. Even, even when you dance in grief, it is freeing because you're letting the grief flow through you as part of the world, part of the universe, part of creation. You don't have to hold it all yourself, right? Um, but in this story, Herod cannot dance. I say that, um, one, because he doesn't. But, uh, but more than that, um, people who need others to come and dance for them, it's often because they cannot dance themselves. So when I, when I hear this story, and I know I'm, I'm reading more into it at this point, but, but Herod cannot dance. So Herod is not free. You remember, like... like um, King David and, and his dancing. Remember, he danced. Uh, he danced naked um, after winning battles. He danced. Uh, he danced naked when when uh, when they restored the Ark of the Covenant. All that kind of stuff. David danced. David was not necessarily a great guy. Um, we can talk about that another day. 
But David is confident in his relationship with God. He's in relationship with God and he dances. And even when his wife despises his dancing, David doesn't care. He just dances. Um, that's, that's, what, that's what real dance is about. Okay, Herod... Herod worries about his wife's judgment an awful lot. Um, we know that Herodias is um, not very fond of, of John. It's one of the reasons John's in prison. Um, and, uh, and, and Herodias will, you know, manipulate her daughter, Salome, to get this oath, to get John the Baptist um, head on a platter. Um, and John is, uh, Herod is just not free to, to fight that. There's no freedom in Herod. His, his privilege, um, his mistakes, his fear have trapped him. He cannot dance. And so he has others to dance for him. Um, but the dancer in this, Salome, daughter of, of, of Herodias. Yeah, she can dance, but is she dancing for herself? Is she dancing for any joy? Is she really dancing? Or is all of this very much choreographed? to get the thing that she wants, which, by the way, isn't really the thing that she wants. It's the thing that her mother wants. How sad is Salome's dance? Um, it may well be uh, enticing to, to Herod, but how sad is that as well? Um, everything in this is just so tainted. There is, no, there is no real dance. Even though this story is about a dance, nobody in the story actually dances. And that's my takeaway today as I think about this. It's when do I dance? When do I express myself in my joy or in my grief, in my confusion? Uh, it just it, When do I celebrate my physical connection to creation? When do I dance? And it might be with my body. It might be with part of my body. It might be something that I can do musically. It might be... Anything that is unfettered and has the potential to be uh, both, um, both, both deeply sad and gloriously joyous. When do I do that? And I can think of some times that I do that, but I can't think of enough times that I do that. And I recognize that this gift of life that I am given, well, I, I'm not, I, I'm not, I'm not enjoying the gift enough. You know, even, even in the midst of, of justice work, even in the midst of hard times, one can dance when one recognizes one's relationship to creation, to God. David could do it. Even when, when things were good and when things were bad, David, David could dance. And here where we have dancing, nobody's actually really dancing. Salome is, is, is not dancing for herself, and it's just all sad and 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 icky uh herod cannot dance herod is bound by by his privilege um that's what i take in this story um and i'm gonna leave it there i think um i know this is you tuned in saying, well, Norm's going to tell us something for sure about, about John the Baptist or about Jesus. And instead, he's given us a really bad verbal dance lesson. Um, but I think it's worth wondering about. I think that very often the uh, author of, uh, of the authors of the Gospels, uh, and in this case, Matthew, um, write at a very deep, um, provocative level. Uh, and I think the whole story and the reason we're drawn to the story of the dance is because there is a lie in this dance. There is no freedom in this dance. There is no connection to creation, no connection to God in this dance. It is manipulative. Uh, it is it is slightly vile. Um, and, um, and it's just all around pitiful. And that's not what I want my life to be. I don't want to be Herod. I don't want to be Salome. Uh, I would rather actually even be John the Baptist, even though he's dead. Um, mostly, though, I would just like to be me. And I would like to dance. Because I am pretty sure that that is the invitation uh, from God, is, is to dance. Anyway, enough for the moment. Let me offer a prayer. 
Loving God, we thank you for the invitation to dance. And much like the first time we were asked to dance, we're not quite sure whether we can. We're not sure whether we're up to the risk. We're not sure whether we're ready to be judged, and we are sure we're going to be judged. But God, when we dare to dance, when we dare to wonder, we discover not, not judgment, we discover not, not fear, but we discover freedom. We can express ourselves, and in our expression, we can recognize your presence. In our words, and in the words that others speak, we can recognize your word. So God, we ask that today's wondering be the beginning of today's dance. May we wonder all day. May we dance all day with you. And in that, may we revel not only in creation, but may we revel in you. We pray through the Holy Spirit and in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, that's enough of me today, and it really should be, don't you think? Um, but I'll check in with you tomorrow. And uh, until I do, dance. However you do it, just unfettered, be who you are and know that God, know that God loves you. Know that God is with you and know that God moves through you. We'll see you tomorrow. God bless.